lost all vision for my life. And, and that was like a very defining moment for me. It was like, I just gave up on everything. I lost that discipline. I lost that reason, that drive. And it wasn't until really focusing on health first that it What's up, everybody? I'm Joe Moffitt with Master Life by Design, and today we are back for another episode on the Millionaire Series. I'm really excited for our guest speaker. We have Nicholas Barely. He is in the Austin, Texas area. He has He's married to his beautiful wife, and they have a little one, and they have an exploding business that I'm personally excited to learn more because I haven't dug into it myself. So, Nicholas, thanks for joining us today. Hey, man. I appreciate you for first creating a space. I remember when I, one thing that was said to me when I was like 12, 13 years old, like changed my life for the negative. And I feel like everyone out there has something where they've been like punched in the face by something and it kind of set their course off the, maybe what they would think is the wrong direction. What I always say is like, if it can happen for the negative, it can also happen for the positive. Mm -hmm. Like if you can change life for the negative in one moment, maybe we could do it for the positive. That first happened for me when I was about 17, I was 60 pounds heavier. I ended up losing 60 pounds in six months. And it was all because of like one distinct moment again. One thing to think about is change always hap happens in instantly. There is no such thing as gradual change. It doesn't happen. If you smoke cigarettes and you try to quit, you try until you finally do. And then you instantly stop. Like the stop happens instantaneously. So my goal is to create those moments, not for the negative, obviously, but for the positive that shifts people's lives forever the same way that my life was shifted. So excited for you who created a space for people to have this. Because at the time when I was 17 or 12, there wasn't a podcast, a YouTube channel mm -hmm. or any of that stuff. So good. So good. You're already dropping bombs and we didn't even jump in yet. I love it. Well, I'd love for you to just share your story. Obviously, like you said, when you were 12, you had that distinction and then you had this big shift when you were 17. So we'd love to hear your story. What was your journey like? Obviously, like everyone, probably have your ups and downs. And so fill us in on what that journey was like, what you learned along the way, what got you to where you are today? And then we'll jump yeah, from there. I think it's relevant, especially when you're talking about life by design and also wealth building and just in general, everyone's journey is very different. And there's some people that maybe you relate to more than other people. I remember even when I got my first meeting with Gary Vaynerchuk in 2016, that was because I was working my dad's family business and so did he. So I was like, oh my goodness, this guy knows what I'm going through. Like I need to get his opinion on this. So for me, my parents were together. They were never married. I found that out like in second grade, even though they were broken up way before that. My I have a brother with a different dad and a sister with a different mom. So same dad with my sister, same mom with my brother. So that just causes a crazy dynamic. My parents broke up when I was like four. So my mom took no governmental support, which means she had to work all the time. We lived in a two bedroom apartment, 10 minutes away from my father. So that was difficult as well. You know, I was the kid who was kind of like a mom's boy at that time. Like just want to be around my mom. Felt more comfortable, natural, like father disciplinary mothers, the comforter. So I'd get yep. dropped off at school at like 6.30, 7 in the morning and then picked up at like 5.30 at night because like there was no really other option. So it's just constantly like in this state of not really ever having a home. You know, it's like I, I go to my dad's and then I go to my mom's and like switch off and never really felt like that family dynamic. And then on top of that, like I had a stepmom move into my house like two weeks after my mom moved out, maybe, clip, maybe even sooner than that. Then it's like, wow you can call her mom too. And it's like, well, I know I'm five or four years old, but like, I still don't feel comfortable with any of this. So then even the dynamics of that, like my mom ended up getting remarried when I was about 12. And is like, you have a stepdad and their family, mom and their family, dad and their family and stepmom and their family. And then you have aunt, you have their brothers and sisters and their grandmas and grandpas and all this stuff. And, and it's just like, massive family that's totally disconnected that makes it feel like you don't really have much family at all. So that, that part's super difficult. Um, I, I struggled a ton with just anxiety and I would maybe say like depression and just, just things like that all the time, just like never really feeling good enough at things. 
at seven years old, like my parents would only fight because of me. They never would have to talk if it wasn't for me. So if, if they were fighting, that's because like I was the thing in the middle that kept them connecting because mm -hmm. if I wasn't there, they would never talk. So it really made me feel like all the problems in life were kind of like my fault. So it was, that was a very difficult thing. Around third grade, I had such crippling anxiety that I literally had diarrhea every day. So like wow. I would constantly be like in the in the principal's office because they thought I was like trying to get out of school. And they were asking me questions like, well, what's your home life like? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, like, I don't feel like anything that crazy. Like, I don't know what's going on. But that's put pressure on my mother as well. My dad ran a business, so he's busy. My mom's at work, but she's solo providing for herself as well. And then she's got a kid who's constantly calling in sick every single day. Like, what am I supposed to do? And so that was very difficult because even though that's a hard situation for them, again, you think it's your fault because you're yeah. like, I'm not doing this on purpose. Like, I don't know what the heck, but they get frustrated. It's a very difficult situation. I would say that I always wanted my father's approval was like, always what I constantly wanted. Like I remember being five years old and like I got my first motorcycle and I would just always think my dad's watching, you know, like he's watching. I remember wanting a new motorcycle and I could see my dad sitting in his lawn chair and I was jumping my motorcycle over and over again. I'm like, if I could just jump higher, if I could just go faster, he's going to recognize that like I'm ready for that next bike. So I always had this like feeling of wanting my dad's approval. And that led me to that first moment that really shift my life forever, which was my dad wanted to be a pro motocross racer. I started racing motocross when I was four to go to be pro. So I'm like years in, I, you know, I'd done well, but not like the best in the world style. And it was finally that moment where I'm like, I think I know what's going to get my dad's approval is if I tell him that I want to be the best and then go out there and do it together. Now, I was a lot better at talking back then. Like, I wouldn't say that I was very like, I was ambitious and had like an addictive personality where I'd go super hard at something. But I also did it when people were looking. So I was a grinder when like there was someone looking over my shoulder. I would be the hardest worker. But the second they weren't, I would not work. Uh, even right at this point, like right at the same time, I was wrestling my freshman year of high school. And I challenged for varsity every single week. Every time the coaches were watching, I'd work hard. But I also didn't understand, like, I wasn't in shape. So because of that, when they'd be like, hey, it's wrestling season, go run three miles. And I was like, bro, I can't run three miles. Like, I've never done this before. So I'd fake it. I'd fake the workouts every day because I was like, man, I'm so weak. So, like, I wanted the external result without putting in the effort. And I didn't understand. Like, I was willing to grind, but I didn't understand, like, how do I get stronger or faster or more endurance? And so I fake it unless they were looking. And then I challenge for varsity every week. So I had this like issue with that as well. So I tell my father, I go, dad, I want to be the best motocross racer in the world. And I'm like, this is the moment. Like he's going to look at me and be like, yes, you finally get it. Let's get a tutor. Let's go on the road. And he looked at me and at the time he said, you're not, you're, you're never going to be the best. Mm -hmm. And it just like, at that point, even Ricky Bobby, like if you're second, you're, you're the first loser. Like if you're not winning your last. That was my mentality was like, what's the purpose of anything if you're not going to be the very best in the world? So like, I gave up on everything. Like I got addicted to playing video games, eight to 16 hours a day. Didn't talk to my father for three years. I gained 60 pounds, went from a three point something GPA to 1.8. I had to take summer school classes, extra college classes just to graduate high school. Same sweatshirt every single day to school to cover up my body fat. I only wear a certain type of pants. I'd, I'd like everything was about how I looked and how I presented myself and hiding. I would never go to a pool. I'd never go to a lake. I'd give, I'd, I'd never had a girlfriend all throughout high school. I used to take scotch tape every day. Every day I take scotch tape and I tape down my man boobs mm. just to like try to make myself look better. So just like soup brought all that insecurity. And one definition that I really like is that self-consciousness is actually just you being conscious of yourself only. So you have no ability to serve or think about anyone else because you're so focused on yourself. How do I look? What do people think? Am I like everything's all about yourself? So it's like self-consciousness makes sense that it's like literally you're just conscious of yourself. And that guy, he told me what he was doing to lose weight. And it was so interesting how simple 
every person that's transformed my life, it's kind of followed these principles that other people can use in their business, their influence, their family. They were all someone doing. So like no one was like preaching at me. This guy was like looking healthy, eating right. And I was like, hey, what are you doing? Like mm -hmm. there's something going on here. He was a doer. And then he shared with me what he was doing. And he shared with me in a way where I believe that it could work because I was seeing it in his life. So I went home, literally got the same foods, never talked to him again. And in six months, I lost 60 pounds. Wow. And that really brought me back into the world again. It was like my stepping stone of like, I got my confidence back. I'm no longer have this like insecurity. But at the same time, I recognized that even though I felt better, life wasn't better. And that freaked me out. And for most men and maybe women, but I, I know what it's like to be a man more than I know what it's like to be a woman, <laughs> is normally it takes a really long time of achievement to come to the realization that no matter what I achieve, it's not going to make a difference. Like the, Jim Carrey has this amazing quote that says, I just I pray that every person in the world would achieve everything they ever desired so they'd realize that it's not the answer. Because yeah. for him... He got everything he ever wanted and realized, oh, wow, it's not the answer that I've been looking for. It's great if it's on top of that answer. So that's where I really like went through this crazy like spiritual journey, like a very young spiritual journey. Never grew up in church, uh, never went to a church even then. I actually got into a bunch of demonic seance style stuff. And that's what I thought like this is where the power is at because Christians were like puny, right? All they did was like not yeah. drink alcohol. I was like, man, these guys are losers. So went down that journey that actually ended up leading me to Jesus I had an encounter with Jesus shifted my entire life. And that's where my whole mission took like a complete different turn. It was less about me, less about my progress, less about sports, bro. And it was more like, all right, it's time to go change the world. I thought I was going to be 30 die as a martyr, ended up going to ministry school, met my wife, got married at 20. She was 18. I went to her high school graduation and now we've been married 11 years and have built everything wow. together. So just like a weird series of events, but just recognizing like middle-class home, like 1,200 square foot house I grew up in. So like father, brick and mortar, carpet cleaning business, 1.8 GPA, regular place, no skill sets on five, six, didn't have any crazy smarts, didn't have crazy influence, like there was nothing really shaping up to tee me up for that next phase where people would look at me and be like, ooh, big things are coming. Right. So just very humbled by the fact that we've been able to do what we've done. And I really believe it's because what we teach now in King's Brotherhood and the four-dimensional businessman, if you look at it, it's like faith, didn't have it, didn't grow up with it, didn't have an example. Health, 60 pounds overweight when you're supposed to have a fast metabolism, you're like growing. Like, and I was still fat relationships, no girlfriend all throughout high school and nothing going for me in that cat, in that arena. And then inside of wealth building or, or business, I didn't have the smarts, the job, like I had no ability. It was like, I literally had no ticket for building wealth. It was like, all right, well, you don't know how to do anything. Like you got to go figure it out. So all those areas I failed so hard and to such a dramatic degree that I was able to overcome it and then craft it and understand it better where our message hits people. So now that hindsight, I'm like, okay, I see what what's going on now, even though at the time, you know, even being married and struggling with finances, like that was not an easy season, but it's what prepped me for what we're doing now. Wow. All right. I got to pause because you just unloaded a ton there, which I think so many people that are watching you, you can relate in some way, shape or form. I, I really hear, as I hear your story, I have so many similarities and similar paths where my parents divorced before I was one and both got remarried and had, you know, my dad had a, I have a half sister and just the whole dynamic moving every year, all that good stuff. But um, one thing that you talked about was you were looking for like your father's approval. And I think there's a lot of men out there, especially um, women do it too, but more so men that I found is they have this performance based mentality. Like they have to seek validation externally when, and I did that my entire life for three decades. I did three decades plus I've done that. 
And, and that really kind of set me up for failure. I think that's the recipe for failure. Whereas when you, when you really know where the source of everything comes from, and we'll touch on that here in a moment, it's like, you don't need to perform, right? You just need to kind of, I'll say you need to obey more so than um, perform. And so that's a spirit that I've, I found within myself that I needed to work on really go to town with coaches, with my own personal self, seeking one-on-one time for me and just really working on that. And so I'm sure you had to have, you know, plenty of time to do that work and uproot that um, as you move forward. Um, The other thing I wanted to just ask about, uh, you said, you know, you had this encounter with Jesus. Do you care to share a little bit more on like what that encounter looked like for you in more details? Because a lot of times people are like, oh yeah, they, you know, why are we talking about God first and business and interviews? But like, if everyone that knows me and listens to this channel, you know, we talk about God and, um, and then with Jesus, I have my own encounter, but I'd love to hear yours and what shifted everything for you from that point forward. Yeah. And it's just, it's just part of my story. Like prior to that experience, I had never really gone to a church. Like I'd never done any of that. So like, what, what's a conviction for me? Does that have to be conviction for others? Because at some point I had the experience that gets me to believe what I believe now. But if you haven't had that experience, then you shouldn't believe or hold yourself to the standard that I live my life by. Cause like me asking you to do that without the encounter is the same way as me looking back. If I were to be told something like I didn't have the experience, like why would, why would I hold myself to that standard? So I'll go both ways. One, I want to touch on what you just said first, and then I'll talk about the encounter. There's a few things that I did that really helped with that mentality. Here's the issue with it of like this father's approval thing and like always wanting people's approval. Fathers, like men do it until their father dies and they realize it after they're like, oh, wow. Like I've been literally still grinding until I'm 40, 50, 60 years old. And when my dad died, then you have nothing to work for. And it's like, that's not the problem with that is that it'll get you an external result. But that doesn't mean that it was a healthy thing. I have a quote that came to me that I believe was Holy Spirit inspired when I was 18. It's that's went this way. I'd rather do what I know is right and fail in the world's eyes than do what I already know is wrong and succeed. So Mm -hmm. there's things that you can do that you already know is wrong, but it'll make you succeed in front of the world. There's other things that you can do that are right, but it'll make you fail in front of the world. And at the time, like I dropped out of community college to study the Bible. And I was, and that's where it came was like, God was like, will you do what you know is right and fail in front of the world? Cause the world's like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't accredited. I was just literally for eight hours a day studying the Bible for no benefit. Like I didn't get a credential or any of this, B- but what, what else would I have done? Like I could have just gone and gotten a job and everyone would have been happy, but I knew it would have been wrong. So it's kind of that internal conviction there. Uh, The second thing is around this. One of the things that I did was in therapy, they'll do this, but doing it from a Christ perspective is so powerful, which is basically going back and allowing God to show you the different areas that have shaped your life. There's these certain either traumas or either or big wins that kind of shape how you view the reality of the world. So I really spent nine months like focusing on God, like what are the things that could hinder me from accomplishing what I'm supposed to accomplish in the future. Can we deal with them now? So I have a clean slate. So there was like a time when I was five and I was playing hide and go seek with girls that were 12 that I looked up to and I hid in a washer and dryer and they never came and found me. They just went and did their own thing. So I felt rejected. And I was Mm -hmm. like, God, where were you in this moment? So really asking God, like, where were you and what's your perspective on this and allowing him to give you a different perspective that allows you to remember the situation, but heal the heart. Because oftentimes when you're growing up, your perception is reality, but it's not, it's far from reality. So it's okay that your perception is real. Like if you think something happened, that's real to you, but it may not be what happened and getting a different perspective is absolutely huge, especially when it can actually heal you. So that was one of the things that I really did for nine months. The other thing to look at is this. If you actually look at the sequence of events throughout the Bible, Jesus was prepped for ministry. There was a guy named John the Baptist who was baptizing people in water to show what Jesus was going to do with the Holy Spirit. It's like, hey, I'm doing it in water. You're going to go down with your old life. You're going to come out with your new life. You're going to be a new creation. This is to show what's to come. 
Jesus comes and John the Baptist like, bro, like I'm supposed to like be showing what you're going to do. Why am I baptizing you? This is awkward. Goes in, gets baptized, right? The Holy Spirit ascends on Jesus and the father speaks audibly and said, this is my son who I'm well pleased. So he literally starts his ministry, but prior to doing anything at this point has done nothing in his calling. And God says already that he's pleased with Jesus. So he starts him out from identity, not for identity. I think it's such mm -hmm. a big distinction. The reason I say this is because the fruit will look the same. Like if you're working for identity, you'll work hard, you'll close deals, you may build a business, but you'll feel empty inside and always be wandering and make really bad decisions. But the fruit of it or even actions may be the same. This would be the same. I once had an employee that was like, came from a business. He was like a business partner with someone who was like a total narcissist, apparently. I don't know. And apparent, like this guy was just a really bad dude, really bad leader. But because he was such a narcissist, he would do like certain things really right. I like some, a lot of narcissists are very successful. He would always open the door for people. And so I had this new hire that came in. I literally moved him out to California, set him up to like pay for all of his bills, got him a position. And every time I'd open the door, he would look at me and be like, that's what my business partner used to do. And so the action was the same, but he thought the person was the same because of the action. This happens in preachers or people of influence. They look at someone who's influential that does it wrong and they go, oh, this preacher just wants attention or this yeah. business owner just wants attention. They just want views. Mm. It's like, well, maybe it's the fruit is the same. Like the actions are the same. But the heart behind it is completely different. But because we only know the bad heart, we look at the action from the good heart and we're like, oh, this guy's just trying to do this because of this same motivation as this other person. So to and from identity is such a big thing. Jesus left there and went into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. And the devil only tempted his identity. So the yeah. devil tempted him in the thing that Jesus or that God just affirmed said, this is my son who I'm well pleased. And he comes at him at him and every time says, if you are the son of God, like he, he was going, can I make Jesus perform for his identity to show me he is who he says he is? If you are the son of God, jump off this cliff for it says, and he used scripture against him and said, it says this. If he were to do that, he would have gone back to performing for identity, saying, I'm going to show you through doing, I am who I say I am, rather than knowing who he was and not having to perform. And oh, recognize yeah. outside of that place, and the last thing he was tempted with was actually a shortcut to get to where he wanted to be, which was all the kingdoms of the earth are mine. If you just submit to me, I'll give you all the kingdoms. I'll give you the world. You're dying for the world, right? So I'll give you it on a silver platter, which is like get rich quick schemes, like people right. that are like, oh, wow, I can get rich with like out having to become educated and get better and constantly evolve and grow. And I'll do that over like the actual path that it takes. And, and so Jesus resisted that, that, that also qualified him for his next step where he's able to go out there and from identity. So also if you have your identity and you know who you are, it's impossible not to do big things and produce fruit. You're still unaware of your identity if you're doing nothing because you're like, well, I know who I am. No, you don't know who you are because if you are a fruit tree, you produce fruit. If you're an apple tree, you produce apples. Whether you like it or not, it just happens. Yep. And so if there is no fruit on the tree, there is still an identity problem. If you're doing things to show who you are, that's also an identity problem. But if you're actually doing things out of an identity, my son, who I'm well pleased, God's already pleased with me. I know who I am. So out of this, because of who I am, I just naturally produce fruit. That's the place we want to get to. Part of it's the healing from the other side. Part of it's understanding how does God look at you, right? Jesus' encounter with that was very unique to him and everyone should be as well, which is where the work comes in. It takes you having a relationship with God to know your identity. You are made in the image of God. Like you can't truly know who you are until you look at God because you are made in his image. So we have yeah. to study who he is to get to know ourselves better, not study who we are. Most That's... people study who they are to get to know themselves better. No, study who God is and you'll get to know yourself better because you're made in his image, in his likeness, with that same morality.
So that's that. Uh, for me, man, when I had an encounter with Jesus, what happened for the very short version of it, I wanted to figure out there has to be something bigger than myself out there, I said. So I'm going to go explore it. I only knew paranormal movies, paranormal activity, ghost hunters, etc. So I whipped out Ouija boards. I went to grave sites. I went to where I knew people had died. And I just started calling in spirits for nine months. Ooh. And we saw tons of spiritual things. Uh, at the time, I don't really know if I knew angels and demons. I called them good spirits, bad spirits. And yeah, we saw stuff float across my house. Uh, spirits call our home phones, our cell phones. Nobody could get cell service. Kids would cry in my house. I'd have 40 people at my house at any given time. I got known as the demon kid in my school, my high school, 3,000 kids. I was known as the demon kid. And I was basically trying to recruit Catholics, Christians, Mormons, Muslims to all come and check out something that was real because I knew their stuff wasn't. It's like, and they would all show up because they knew it wasn't real either. Or like they knew it wasn't powerful and they wanted to experience something that was real and tangible. Now, what's interesting about that is that like, like the devil was equipping me in the spiritual realm for God's purpose before I ever knew God. Because like when you experience that and then you get saved, like it's a whole different game. So yeah. I did that forever. And it really got to the point where I was so gripped by fear, though I was seeing supernatural things like crazy I was spreading that message. I hadn't changed. I was just more gripped with anxiety and fear and all these things. Huh. And there was one specifically that was like really made me fearful. And so all of a sudden, one day I see this kid. I went surfing with him, again, a doer. And I just noticed he was different. I was like, man, there's something different about this kid. He's not like a total ass like he used to be. And I wanted him to be an ass. I was like tempting him. I was like, bro, what's wrong with this kid? Like, he's not who we used to be. So one day I'm kind of feeling like down. I was like, you know what? I should call that kid. Like, he seemed pretty cool. So I give him a call. I'm like, bro, what are you doing? His name's Kyle Berger. Yo, what are you doing? And he was like, oh, man, like, I'm actually on my way to a small group right now. I was like, sick, bro. Can I go? I was like, he plays the drums. So I thought it was like a band. I didn't even know like those were like church words. He was like, nah, bro. Like, you can't go. He's like, you're the demon kid. Like, you cannot come to the small group. And I was like, what were you guys meeting? Well, I was already driving to the exact location they were meeting. It was like a cafe. I was like, bro, I'm already on my way there. I'm coming. Like, I'll come hang out, which is just so crazy. So I get there, and they're they're studying a book that's about miracles, miracles for today, just like they were for Jesus. And this is three kids, high school. One of them was like the youth pastor, but he was 19. So he graduated one year before me and they get done and they're like, Hey, like, sorry, this is not supposed to be like a, you don't know Jesus. Like, come on. Like, this is supposed to be a study for people that know. And I was like, I'm not afraid. Like I talked to demons and they were like, they were freaked out. Cause they were like, just going down this journey. They're like, Oh my gosh. And I was like, thanks guys. Like great meeting you. Like I'm going to go. What's crazy is they said, they basically, they didn't invite me back for the next week yet, but that whole week, I all of a sudden gave this massive desire to read the Bible. I started shifting internally. I started getting convicted of things that I was doing wrong. I had this like massive desire to serve. And I started telling kids at my school, hey, I'm going to get a Bible and I'm going to read it to see why do people read it? Why do they read it their whole life? A book, you read cover to cover and you get it. Like it's a book. Like why do you keep studying it and like, highlighting and all this stuff. So I'm like, I'm going to figure out what's up with, with this. And so everyone's like, huh, that's interesting. Well, I didn't know you get a Bible like in every hotel and on every street corner. So they were <laughs> like, if you come back to the Bible study, the small group, we'll give you one. So I had to wait all week. I was like, oh my gosh, like I need to get there on Wednesday. Like Wednesday, I'm going to the Bible study. So I go to the Bible study and the youth pastor looks at me and I forgot to say right before this as well, I actually confessed the thing that I was so afraid of to the kid that I thought was different, Kyle. And he was so newly like acquaintance to this whole church thing that he thought he was going to die because I told him. He was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you told me this. Like, we're all going to die. And so the youth pastor came, he prayed for me. And when he prayed for me, it was crazy. It's like, I felt something leap off my body. Got kind of like dizzy. I was like, whoa. So then I went back to that place and the youth pastor looks at me and was like, do you want, do you want to just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And I was like, yeah, dude, like, why did you tell me this like before? You didn't even tell me like what's next? <laughs> like, yeah, this sounds great. 
So they pray with me right there. We go to my house. We burn all that like demonic stuff that we had. We lit it all on fire. And literally my, my, my heart changed. I had to tell my family. I was like, Hey, like I'm going to church now. Like, I didn't know what else to say. I didn't know how to pray yet. I knew nothing. It's like, I'm going to church now. And they're like, cool. Like, awesome. Like, no, like, this is like my whole life's changed. Uh, we started a prayer group the next morning. So I got saved on Wednesday, February 3rd, 2010. And the next morning, February 4th, at 4.45 a.m., I was waiting outside the youth pastor's house because we started a prayer group at 5 to 7 a.m. before school for high school students the next day. That next Tuesday, I got involved in a prayer group that was 5 to 7 a.m., for business men of 30 guys that I went to every Thursday and drove 35 minutes to. I had to leave at 4.35 in the, or 4, 4.25 in the morning to get there at 5 a.m. every Tuesday. And then we led one every Thursday uh, for that entire year. So just like wow. 100% like completely different person, the way I did things, the way I talked, everything was different. Wow, that's crazy. And that was all in high school. Yeah, this is my senior year. So you get saved. You, you're you plugged into these groups. You're going to Bible study in the morning. You're going to a business um, well, a group that you would say. Yes, in prayer morning. group, like prayer full group. prayer, like an hour of testimonies, an hour of straight prayer. Oh, come on. That sounds like what we do at 530 in the morning on Tuesdays, too. Um, so... So obviously you started leaning in. And so what led you to the business world? How did you get into the business world? What was the kind of the stepping stones to what was to what you have now, what you've created now? The foundation of it definitely came from my father. When I wrote my book, Modern Day Businessman, which if anyone messages me on Instagram, I'll literally ship them a copy and I'll pay for the shipping and everything. Just send me the address. When I wrote it, I really realized how much my father had helped me. He wasn't perfect, but I mean, he showed me that like if there's value to be given in the world, people will exchange dollars for value. So like he helped me start a business when I was 12. I I had like 3000 bucks in my sock, sock drawer as a young kid. I was always like a saver more than an investor because I didn't really know that world, but I, I understood like I could accumulate money. And so that was like something that I had a little bit of a gifting in, but I didn't really have a passion for it because it wasn't, it wasn't cool that my dad would pick me up in a work truck. You know, like that wasn't like a cool thing. I was like, I want like to get picked up in a cool, like regular vehicle, not a work vehicle. I'm like embarrassed by that. And so I, I wouldn't say that that was a passion of mine. I want to be a pro athlete. And then when I got saved, I was like, I'm just going to go preach. Like that's what I'm going to do. So I actually had this crazy encounter with this guy that like, shifted my whole life forever on a Jesus side after all of this. I was like, bro, you are walking in a whole different level of power of the Holy Spirit that I've never experienced. Where do I get this? And he was like, well, I go to, I live up in Redding, California at this place called Bethel School Ministry. And I was like, I'm in, I'm moving, like I'm going. So like I picked up everything, moved to Redding, California. My wife and I dated at that time for the year at Bethel. She got accepted as well. Went there for a year, got married in between. And then afterwards, I don't know. I think it was like a, co a compilation of a few things. One, I had this new thing of like, I need to provide for my wife. And like, how am I going to do that? Two, I have no education and no job history. And so like, I had no job when I got married. And so I was like, what, what can I do? What could we do together? Like we teach this a lot with like couples now, because it was like, for us, it wasn't like we worked together for a strategy or like. I need to retire my wife. It was like, hey, we need to create a business and make money. And it's probably better if we both work at it than not. So like that was the logic. And we want to spend time together because we just got married. So why go work two separate jobs? Yeah. Let's spend every day together. So we got shipped a bag of shake mix in the mail and it was a network marketing company. We're like, sick, this is it. Let's join. Uh, we met our best friends there and a fr my friend that I'm partnered with in two different things right now. We met inside of that company. And if it wasn't for that, we would have never met. And so that's what really got us into business. And we just really felt like that's where we were supposed to go. So imagine leaving ministry school, going to 14 different countries. That's where we had all our momentum, all of our breakthrough. And God's like, go here. And we failed. The business failed. I went from a townhome, brand new BMW, 
to a one bedroom apartment, no air conditioner, 110 degrees in the summer and like cleaning carpets, main source of income from my, for my father, I was making 20, 20 to 21 K a year. My wife was making nine K a year as a receptionist at a massage department. And it was like a total reset where we just got totally humbled, like lost everything, all my ambition, all of that stuff. And we went on a three year stint of like not profiting from our business. We interned for health coaches. We got mentors. We bought courses and like didn't make any money. Like there was just something like we just couldn't make it happen. And I was just like so down about it, man. Like we had a $37.50 each grocery budget, $25 eating out budget split per week. So $12.50 each. We were paying off $100 of debt per month at like our best time. So just like very down, like, God, like what, what happened? Like we were preaching to like 800 people seeing like massive breakthroughs to like, I'm cleaning carpets all day because I suck at business. And that's when we really, like I had a realization that it was like, if I keep going down this route, I'm just going to be like my dad and I'm never going to do any, like he did big things, but like, that's not my destiny. Right. Like I'm not going to do what I, I feel like I'm meant to do on this earth. I'm meant to do something big. So I was almost like that reality became more scary than investing in mentors, like true mentors and community. So where we found is we went to, we met this guy, we did an online summit, built our list for our health company, we built like 3,500 emails from our, our, this is like 2013, 2014. So we're doing an online summit, meet this guy, phenomenal guy, end up going to his event. I didn't go, my wife did. He pitched a mastermind 2015 and my wife calls me and is like, they won't let me buy. They say I have to call you because we're too broke. And like, they know they don't want to deal with it. But like, I want to join this mastermind. And I think it's what we need. And I just felt like God say like, if I say no to her, I'm already doing the wrong thing. If we mm. do this and it's the wrong thing, at least we'll know. But if I say no, and she thinks this is something we need, like that's already wrong. She would never do anything to harm our family. So I said, let's do it. We charge it all on a credit card. It would have taken me five years to pay off just that one charge. So like not easy. Uh, six months later, I went to the first event for that mastermind and never showed up on a call because I was too embarrassed. I was getting my identity from what I was doing. Mm. And so I was too embarrassed because that my identity was I was a broke carpet cleaner. I went to the event like I didn't want to go. And I just found people that believed in me, that were further ahead than me, that helped me out, that gave me perspective. So crazy, dude. We left there. We did over 22 grand that month in our business. I called my dad. I was like, dad, I gotta, I can't carpet clean anymore. And I was so afraid that it was a fluke. Like two months later, I'd have to go call my dad and be like, well, I got to come back and carpet clean. Like it was super scary. And 14 months later, we did $180,000 in a week. And I was like, what is going on? Like, right. this is absurd. And like, God, for me, uh, if you go through First Timothy, this is around ministry, but it says you don't muzzle the ox when you're basically harvesting grain. Because if you muzzle the ox, he's not going to eat the grain, which is good for you. But the problem is he's going to have to take breaks and he's not going to push his heart. Yeah. And like, for me, our mission in business and like there's four real S's that people can go through, which is around survival. Like you're not making enough money for even yourself. Stability, which is the hardest because you're making enough, but you can't do anything. You have things like success, which is you're making enough for you and to do what you want, but maybe the way you're making money or the impact you're making with money isn't big. And then you have this like massive one where you get to significance and you're able to make money through ways that are impactful and impact people and things way greater than yourself outside of it. So for us, it was like, our business is a way for us to not be muzzled where we're like, oh, we're going to go make money over here so that we could do this impactful thing. We're like, no, we're going to make money through what's impactful so that we're not muzzled while we're out there just harvesting. And so that's how we created things. Like I went from a health company, a health company for men, a men's community, where we started impacting men all over the world 
and now King's Brother here, where we specifically work with Christian businessmen as a business mastermind and community to help them de develop biblical principled businesses that grow and scale while not sacrificing their personal life and their faith. So it's like, I already did it with men that were not Christians because the business principles work. But I thought, wow, what if we can equip these men that will actually create significant businesses where they're able to give more than they've ever given before. They're able to do the vision building at their church and build the new building. They're able to give more in a year than they used to make in five years. Like we will give this year more than I made every year. It would have taken me five years, not of profit, five years of just all my income that went to just my, you know, my, my actual expenses, five years of me just eating, sewing into just our church. And so it's like so exponential for us. And so what we do now is like, how do we not muzzle, but make money in a way that's super impactful, that's far greater than, you know, the money that I make, but I'm able to make money doing something that's impactful rather than make money so I can do something impactful. Mm, so good. So good. I hope everyone that's watching, I hope you go back and watch this again. Because there is just so much truth, so many principles in there that you could take away and apply into your life because it makes a huge difference. I love what you said is an apple tree produces apples, right? Like it produces fruit. And so for everyone watching, you got to look, take a look at your life. Maybe you're winning in one area, but there's other areas you're not. You're not producing fruit. You should be producing fruit in all areas, right? To lean into the faith a little bit more. It's like Jesus didn't come for you to just live successful in one area. He wants you to be successful in all areas. He said, I came to give you life and give it more abundantly, right? And so um, I love that, that you hit on that and your just your walk and how you came to business to this point right now. And so um, as you touched on a little bit around what you guys do in your business, could you share maybe one or two of your favorite success stories um, just to raise faith in someone that might be, they might be winning. They know there's another level, but they just feel like they're hitting this roadblock. They're not getting past it. Maybe someone that you've helped in your business that could like raise their faith um, as a testimonial. Yeah, bro. We got so much. And, and there's a lot of really good documented stories at apply.thekingsbrotherhood.com. Apply.thekingsbrotherhood.com. There's like a bunch of like, clips of guys and these ones are just the newest ones so we'll take like the ones over the last year because i like we have a lot like we have like i'll have to look again but we have like seven hours of testimonial videos come on that's Something awesome. ridiculous um but two come to mind that are pretty interesting because they're very different maybe another one will but these first two are very significant to me one of them came to our very first event that we did uh our first men's event and he came in, he was kind of like a partier, going to clubs, had a girlfriend, was full-time in the in military at the time, at Navy, was super embarrassed by that. So it really hit me because I was really embarrassed about my carpet cleaning career. And like, I was really embarrassed. I was overweight. So when I created a health company, I used to not share my overweight photos because I was like, no one wants to learn from like a dude that used to be fat. They want to learn from like the athlete, like the guy who was like alpha killer. I didn't know like real marketing. And so this guy was like, everyone thought he was kind of a jerk because he would never talk to anyone until like 7 p.m. And they were like, bro, you have a marketing company. Like, why are we so last on the totem pole? And it was because he was full-time working in the military and no one knew. So he's really like awesome if people knew, but people like thought he was kind of a jerk. So he came to one of our events. I pitched our, our brotherhood mastermind working with me, bringing in experts, the ideals of the four-dimensional businessman and three-dimensional at the time. And he ended up leaving there, going in his pajamas, talking to his girlfriend, and they were so convicted to come back and invest with us that they came back to the event when we were tearing down in their pajamas to swipe their card. Wow. Like it was unreal. And the identity shift, which is number one with what we do is like, when people invest with us, they're investing in this is who I am now. I'm no longer this guy. I am a four-dimensional businessman. These are the decisions that I make. This is how I make decisions. This is how I act. Kind of like we talked about, like you become this apple tree where it's like you just naturally produce that fruit because you're saying, this is who I am now. Because of that, I do these things. This is who I am and this is what I do. So he comes back 
and he had done like a couple hundred grand in business over the years. He did 863K before our first event. He got, he ended up engage, getting engaged. I was at the party for them to get engaged. He was so impacted that he asked for me to be a groomsman in his wedding. So wow. I end up going to be a groomsman in his wedding. He gets married, would have never gotten married. We're talking like mid thirties at the time, like late, like right around that mid thirties. Uh, girlfriend's mid thirties as well. Gets married, now has two kids. So I was in the wedding party, married. He has two kids. Hit Inc. Five thousand. Did thirty five million last year, maybe a little bit more. And just like, like this, like massive progression of just like the fruit. Like, hey, these are the four dimensions. This is the fruit of that. Uh, so that's one of them. And that was just like, he retired from the military, transitioned really well, has now even helped the military people and done stuff with them, helping them launch businesses and new careers. Very cool. Uh, the second one is a guy named Sathya. And this is interesting for like people that maybe have done impactful work or they've maybe been in ministry, but they really haven't made a lot of money. Sathya came to us, came to one of my events. He was making 30K Canadian per year as a pastor at an awesome church called the airport church in, in Canada. And he's mostly working in like the men's ministry. So you could think like I'm impacting men outside of that. So he comes to the event. He's like, dude, I'm not a business guy. Like I'm a pastor, but I have this product. I want to help men quit porn. Like, well, like what can we do? I was like, yeah, dude, like, like I feel something on it. Cause I normally wouldn't let someone like that in, a, in our, we only work with people that have a pre existing business. So he joins up and it took him, he's been in the community for two years. He's renewing for three years, like this month. He has a kid on the way right now. He's married and his kid's going to be born like literally October. So he comes, he, the first event, I remember he's at 20 K a month, then 40 K a month. He just flew out here. He's now doing 90 K in a digital product coaching business, helping men quit porn. And he just six months ago, he's on that apply.kingsbrother, like the top one. Cause it was so cool for me. Cause in that video, this about six months ago, he was like, I think I can finally call myself a businessman. Mm. He's like, I never really believed it for like the first year and a half. But what I loved about it is that for me, it took about three and a half years to start producing a profit online. And for him, it was like, came out of ministry, just like me, started his product, did it right made the right decisions, had the right mentors, had the right advisors, had the right community, had the right frameworks. And was like, came to the meeting. It was like, Hey, we're at 20 K per month. And I'm like, you know, for people listening, that's pretty insignificant. You're probably not really making a lot of profit. You're not, your revenue is like not even a doctor's salary. So it's not that impressive, but I was just like, wow. Like I didn't do that until like three and a half years in. And like, I finally went to an event like this and then to him now kind of hitting that million dollars a year is just like super eye-opening for me. And the fact that he didn't need to be this, like, I'm a business guy. I'm a killer. Like we had the best products in the world. He was like, I'm not really a business guy, but like, I have a good, good story, a right framework. And like with the right framework, it's not so much around you being like this hardcore person. You follow the framework and it works. And me holding, you know, over a hundred events, and since 2017, I've never held a, pro a not profitable event. So every event I've held has been profitable. No matter what I do now, like I just know the framework. Like well, same with sales teams and sales scripts. Like we just know the framework. Like whether you think you're awesome or not, like it just works and people close and people buy. And it's just how, it's just the framework. And it's less about the having to feel like you're some really crazy person. That's awesome. I love hearing about that. And like you said, I think the key for everyone, well, there's many, but what you just said there around the framework, there's a lot of people out there right now, maybe you, you're in a good business, you're in a good position with your job, but you know, you have this thing that's on your heart, you want to start a business and it, what's the framework you're going to operate from? Or maybe you have a business, but you're just not yeah. getting traction the way you want to, to the next level. It's like, what's yeah, the framework? And even one last one, bro. It's like, I have another friend. He built the fourth fastest growing company in the United States, sold it by 29 and like massive growth. And he ended up becoming a partner in King's Brotherhood now. But like, just to see someone like him devote, like, hey, I want to be healthy, have a great family. He has the third kid on the way, exited his business and really is like, 
gone spiritually deep into like, Lord, show me my next steps. And like the mm -hmm. logical next steps isn't always God's next steps. So the, the ability to be able to hear God's voice and know his word inside of business situations and to to go after something bigger after, you know, doing 200 million, it that plenty of that as well, where it's like, whether they're spiritually fit and need business fit or like both, or they are business fit and they're like, all right, how do I hear God's voice? How do I make a bigger impact? How do I partner with my money? And obviously, how do I grow and invest the money? We bring in some phenomenal people. I, I really like Jim Dew. He's a phenomenal guy. Um, and he really comes in and, and shows that path forward because you need a vision, whether you have the money or not. There has to be a vision of where you're going with the wealth and what there is to look forward to. So you can like have checkpoints to like, huh, I'm going to invest in this real estate deal at this point, or I'm going to get this policy at this point. And like, you have something to look forward to where you're not just like working to make money. You know, in Hebrews, they talk about the scripture. Many of you probably have heard. It says faith is the substance or hope is faith is the substance of things hoped for. Right. But the second part is, is the evidence uh, of things that are not seen. And if you don't have that vision, if you don't have those checkpoints, you'll dismiss the evidence that God's laid down for you. And you'll just think this isn't working. I'm not there. I, there's a larger gap than there actually is. You think it's like, I got to go from the bottom step to the top. How am I going to do this? But God's actually putting a rung on the ladder uh, with that evidence, but you dismiss it because you don't understand it. And so um, that's powerful. I, I love that. And so um, before we wrap up, I got a couple of questions for you, but who would be, so if someone's watching, they're like, man, this sounds amazing. Like who's your ideal fit for your mastermind? Yeah. So man, specifically, <laughs> uh, my wife runs Queens Collective, which is for women, mostly for the men's wives in the community that's ran separate. So it's like off of that. Um, so that's number one, Christian. So Jesus is Lord of their life, or that's, you know, they can join the community. That's something they're interested in because I run a show called God's Business. So I get people that are like, bro, how have these people built these businesses hearing from God? Like, I'm interested in that God. I've never heard of this before, which was like yeah. me. I was like, I see supernatural stuff. Why would I go to your church that doesn't? Mm -hmm. So like, I was like, but if they told me that, I was like, hey, I'm kind of into this. Like, there's something happening. There's something real, which is really big and and has a business. And really for us, it's around two things. They go to church and they have no one they can relate to in the business sense. The majority of the people there, the majority of the men. So they never feel seen and heard or understood. So they they grow spiritually, but it doesn't help their business. They go to their business mentors. They learn how to grow in the business, but they're not getting sharpened spiritually. It creates this, this like paradox where every time you build your business, your faith weakens. You're not as equipped. And every time you build your faith, you see your finances dwindle. So you end up hating both of them and always jumping from one to the other. Go through a season where you're like, heavy spiritual growth, but none of them understand the business. If you want to be around like-minded men, Christian men that actually want to grow in both of those areas and learn how to build a biblical business where we actually go in depth on what does God actually say about this? What is he saying now for this? And how can we support each other in that? That's what the community is for. So we just really bridged the gap there where I didn't think it was possible. I didn't think that there was, a, well, obviously I didn't think there was a community like it, but at the same time, when I learned business, I didn't have a Christian leader to learn from. So the more I was around non-Christian leaders that were pouring into me, the more I became like them. Mm. Just how it is. Uh, so, and so if you want to be fine adapting to the environment you're in while growing your wealth, that's what we created. So good. So good. Well, guys, make sure you check him out, what he's doing. We will have all the links in the show notes for you, everything that you need. Um, so I highly encourage you go watch those testimonials, right? Don't, don't just take his word for it because he's the one running it, right? Everyone's wow. a good salesperson when they believe in their own business, but go check out the fruit that's been produced from in others' lives, right? Go hear the testimonials. That's what I always look at. I always want to look at two things I look at. Number one is, do they produce fruit? And number two is I want to know what they struggled with, because if I know that they struggled, like I struggled, then I know it's possible, to do what they've done, right? And so I need yep. both aspects for me. Um, you might be different. And my number one rule in coaching people is know thyself. So figure out what you need to be 
to say like, this is for me or this isn't for me. But I, I will promise you that if you dive in and dig in um, from everything Nicholas just said, you'll see that this is more than likely for you. And if you're, and what if someone, and I, I want to ask this because there's a lot of people who they watch, you know, they watch your channel, they're believers, but then there's people who don't believe. What if someone's like, everything you said is, a, is amazing. Um, I don't have Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Like, what do you say to those people? Yeah, you want him? Let's do it right now. Like, that's what I would say to them. If someone came to me and said that, I'd be like, you want him to be your Lord and Savior? Like, that's what someone had asked me, you know? But, if they, you know, if they were like, hey, I just want the business stuff, like none of this Jesus stuff, I would just tell them to go somewhere else and I'd have a referral for them. It's just not the culture. That's not what we work with. It's just, we have a high standard and and all the guys that do believe that know that we have that standard and meaning a high standard, meaning we actually stick to what we say. Like if we can't benefit someone, then we won't, we won't help them. But yeah, I would, I'd be like, do you want to? And if they said yes, <laughs> I'd be like, well, you can join this as well. We're a business mastermind. Like we're not yeah. a, we're not a faith mastermind. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't charge someone for that. Um, there's plenty of phenomenal churches and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, if someone was like, yeah, bro, I want to, I'd be like, cool. And you, I'd totally let them in and let them get developed in it. Um, but if not, and they were against that, then, then yeah, they wouldn't be a good fit for our community, but I know plenty of other communities. They are a good fit for like plenty. We had two conversations the last two days with people that just weren't a good fit for our community. Okay. I just don't think this is like, based on what you're saying, this isn't even what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know what I mean? It'd be like, well, what if someone doesn't want to run a business, but they like what you have to say, but they don't want to run one? Well, I'd never sell them a business program then. <laughs> right? Because like, that's jacked. Like they can like it all they want, but if they're like, I really don't want to run a business, but I really like what your program has to offer. Yeah. Like, oh, cool. Like, let's connect you to what's right for you. And if you know someone who wants to actually run a business, then like send them our way. Same thing, you know, like that's, that's how I would deal with it. Um, but also I'd connect them to the podcast. We have tons of free stuff. I'd give them a book. Like it's obviously contextual and depending on where they're at, but I have plenty of that. Like I have plenty of people that are like, man, I even think Jesus is cool, but like, I don't follow what he says or like, he's, he's not Lord of my life. I'm like, that's awesome, man. Like, let's talk about that. Here's some resources. Like congrats on talking about it. Like same thing with me. Like I didn't, I had to go through all my stuff before I ever made a decision. So I don't expect people to like hold themselves to the standard that I do without having yep. my experience. Because oh, before my experience, I didn't believe any of the things I'm talking about either. So good. I love it. There's one thing between being like, we'll just in this context that we're talking about being a, what qualifies you to be part of your mastermind. One thing about being a fan of Jesus, but there's another like being a teammate of Jesus, right? Like getting on the field and being a teammate. So uh, yeah, people will say like, I believe in Jesus. And it's like, yeah, so did the devil. You think he doesn't believe in Jesus? Like, oh, he doesn't. I don't believe that he's real. It's like, no, like he knows. He knows yep. scripture front to back. So yeah, it's one thing to be a believer and it's another thing to be a follower. And that's why I say Lord so much. It's like, there's a lot of people out there that are would be afraid to say he's Lord of my life. Like I've given everything to him. I've died to myself. But like, that's what's required. Let me ask you this before we jump into these questions. Um, I'll, I'll share just a personal moment for since I learned about money. Um, I remember... For everyone listening, I remember that I, after I got saved, I got saved at an Amway event in Las Vegas. So Sin City, so really cool spot to get saved. Um, and I remember it was even up to recently, like I would have waves at war seasons where like money was, I worship money more than Jesus, right? Like it well, says in the word, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't serve too much masters. money and, and and God, right? And so I literally found myself, you know, living, breathing, thinking nothing about money. And it's funny when you're, if you guys have ever been broke, I remember being thirty thousand or forty thousand dollars in credit card debt for the third time. So I like to think I'm an overachiever. I do. I don't do it once or twice. Got to do it three times. Um, but I remember like when I didn't have it, it was like that's all I thought about. Now that we, my wife and I have, we have it. 
it's not that we don't think about it, right? We want to be good stewards of it, but we don't idolize it anymore. So my question to you is, what do you do when you interview someone, they're a believer, but you identify in this process, like the, their master is money. How do you, how would you handle a situation like that versus, you know, helping them make that shift to worshiping Jesus, you know, seeking first the kingdom of God before anything else? What, what would you do there? Well, one, I, I would take an internal check first, right? Is like, I, I, it takes, e even in Timothy that I mentioned earlier, it's like, hey, someone shouldn't be a leader if their household isn't in order, then they shouldn't be a leader in the church. Like, that's what Paul wrote. And so it's like, it, if that's number one, it's like, I take an internal check of like, what am I doing? Like, am I following what I'm supposed to be doing in that area? The second one is I generally wouldn't really care about what other people are doing. Like, and usually like, I'd be like, oh, that's interesting. Like, you know, it's very tough to know if someone's like making money, their master by just having a conversation. Cause again, they can sound the same. If we're trying to hit revenue goals, that can sound the same as someone whose money's their master as it is for someone who's like, just trying to hit a revenue goal um, mm -hmm. or have a different ambition. Um, just like if someone cares about people and the product they have could, could help that person, they should sell them. And they could just be wanting to help someone, but it'll look the same as the person trying to make money because they both should be trying to sell them. They just have two different motivations. Uh, but the other one is obedience to, to what God says. So it's like, are they giving? Are they tithing? Are they tithing? Are they connected to their local church? Like these are like things that I would look at that if I was more so would not in an interview or like meeting someone, I wouldn't really give a rip. I would just, you know, talk to them. Um, but if it was someone that I was really looking to either connect with, be friends with, do business with, partner with, learn from, if I'm going to submit myself to them, then I want to know those things. And mm. so generally it's like, well, if they're not tithing, then that's a good, good thing like to look at. It's like, are they giving away minimum 10% of everything that they make their increase pre-tax? Yeah. Like you don't pay, you don't, you don't do 10% after you pay taxes on your check. So good. Like if you get a, if you get a check in the mail from an investment, you tithe on it. Like it just, and it's different from being uneducated and then trying to find loopholes. Like if you don't know that you're like, I invested a million dollars into this thing or hundred K and it pays me out 10%, but they pay out monthly. And you're like, oh, like I already tithed on the 100K. Like, this is great. You just don't know. That's different than like, I don't want to do this. And there's times where I try to find ways around it. It's like, oh, I'm moving churches. Like, I'll just give to this foundation or this person, but not really track it. And it just became like a non-negotiable for us where we're like, no, like we're giving above and beyond that every month because like we need to know that we'd rather have God involved in everything that we do and submit money to him rather than be submitted to money. So those are mm -hmm. some of the things. So like there's the practical side. I less would be worrying about everyone else. I'd more so have everyone take like an internal check of themselves and be like, where am I doing that? And realizing like God knows you, God knows every person, God knows your deepest desires and it's okay to get it wrong and to be like, Hey God, like why do I keep like trying to put this first? What can I do to get to know you better or to not put this first? Yeah. Like, it's not like, oh, I need to put this first. Like, I need to get it perfect. It's like, man, God, like, I have an issue with this. This is crazy. I desire not to do this, but for some reason it keeps coming up. Can you give me better perspective or help empower me to get over this? Yeah. Like, that's the perspective I go for. I'd maybe go to some of those mentors and be like, what are some practical things I can do to exercise this? Where do I need breakthrough? Like, what's my perspective shift that I need? You know, so I think everyone's done it to, to some extent at some time because it's meant to be done healthy, but it's easy to make it unhealthy where it's like, oh, if I just made more money, life would be better. You know, like, oh, like if I could just, I could give to all this stuff and I'll do such good works. And it's like, it's that whole thing that everyone talks about. If you can't tithe with a little, definitely not going to do it with much. Well, I had a great example of one of my best friends has never made less than $5 million a year since 2018. And, but he made no money before that. And I saw him faithfully tithe and more the entire time. Wow. So when you're around people like that, you're like, ah, well, like, you know, if he can tithe minimum 500K a year, you know, 
you could give less than that. So it's like, are you around people like that too? Are they setting that example or are they trying to find loopholes? Tithing isn't talked about in the New Testament. It's like, okay, giving everything is though. So which one do you want to do? Like you figure it out, you know, but it's still like, I think those are, those are some common things. I'm, I'm assuming you run into that on your show, stuff like that. And it's like, you know, they take the meat and spit out the bones. Yeah. Like, no, I like that. It's not a qualifier for you. Um, but if it is, it is a qualifier for you, if you're going to allow someone into your world. And so oh, yeah. friendship, a- deep friendship, like, again, depending on what, what, where they're at in the boundary mentorship for sure. If that's in, if I'm getting life mentorship, there's plenty of people I don't know their internal workings that they're giving that are great at marketing or they're great at AI. And I just take that from them and not anything else. But if I'm going to do life with them and grow spiritually and learn from them, those are things that are a big deal to me and more so now than ever before. That's awesome, man. I love it. I absolutely love that. All right. Well, you've been gracious with your time. So let's just rock okay. with some um, rapid fire questions really quickly. Um, outside of the Bible, and people say Think and Grow Rich or Rich Dad, Poor Dad, outside of those three books, is there a book that's impacted your life or your business uh, more so than any of those? Outside of the Bible, outside of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Think and Grow Rich, and what was the other one? That, that, that's it, because those, those are the three most common that I get all the time, right? So, yeah, I think one that was really good for me that's by Bill Johnson is this the pa- supernatural power of a transformed mind, I think it was. Mm. So, that one's pretty sick because, again, it's like also a mental shift. That one was really good. The I really liked, I think it's the autobiography if that's what who when it's written by the writer. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's was really good. That was really fun. You know, cr- crazy enough, David Goggins' book is really, really good on mental fortitude and just like, I need to understand that I can be disciplined. And so his original book, those were those are three big ones that I've pulled up in my past and been like, these have been helpful. Nice. Good stuff. What was that supernatural one? supernatural power of a transformed mind Got it. and it's really taking that like be transformed by the renewing of your mind mm, audiobook i'm audiobook. sure it is all right i'm like i'm an audiobook guy i don't know about other people out there I was sitting down for a physical book although it is very uh relaxing and refreshing it's like when you got two yep. kids five to three you don't get much time to be able to do that so right. <laughs> the books it is um, what was one piece of advice that you got that transformed your life? Obviously outside again, introduced to Jesus, um, one, one, maybe practical one for either in life or business that really hit you. So commitment means to do what you said you were going to do after the feeling you set it in is gone. If you mm-hmm. feel like doing it, commitment isn't required. You make decisions while you're in a good state. They commit you to them even when you're not feeling good. You don't change those decisions when you're in a bad state. And it's more important to make a commitment to yourself and follow through than it is to make a commitment to others and follow through. It's easy for me to get on the show because you're waiting here on the other side. It's a lot harder to say, I'm going to go to the gym at 6 a.m. when no one's watching. And those commitments following through on them is how you build trust with yourself so that you don't make commitments and then your subconscious mind tells you liar you never do what you're going to say so that was very impactful for me especially as someone who would fake my workouts growing up mm. so good last one for those that may want to start a business they might be watching and be like man everything you're saying is amazing i know you take businesses and you help them go to the next level but what's one piece of advice if you for someone that would be starting a business, what could they do to really get on a path of success a lot faster than trying to figure things out all on their own? Yeah, I I think they shouldn't is what they should do. They shouldn't start a business. Mm. Tell me more. And For everyone there that's like, I'm not going to start a business now. Good. You would have failed anyway. And for the people that are like, I don't know what he's talking about. I'm going to do it anyway. Cause I, no one's going to tell me what not to do. Good. <laughs> Go do it. Because if I can shake them off one sentence, they shouldn't start a business. Like they're mm-hmm. too weak for it. 
end of story. You don't want it enough. You're not called to it enough. Get over it. Like go do it a different way. But if you want to start a business still, then awesome. Do it. The two things that I would do is this is I would either find someone who's building the business that you want to build and just go and somehow be connected to them and help them. And that's because you get to see all the frameworks of the team building, the hiring, the structure, the format, the systems, the processes. It's so an annoying to me. It's like you literally get to get paid and educated at the same time. So that's number one is like, that's the easiest thing to do is like entrepreneurship for the exact model that you want to build because you become so valuable outside of that. Um, and then the second one is around paying for education is like, this weird thing because I talked about the guy, the business that we helped him start and he's now at 90 K a month and he was profiting right off the bat. It took me three and a half years to do that, but it also took me three and a half years to find the right education to buy. And when I bought it, I became profitable. So I could look at that and be like, that costs money. So because of that, I needed to wait till I had money to buy it. Or I can look at it and say, well, if I bought it three years prior, I maybe would have been profitable on year one which means that not buying it three years prior cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars. So which one was more costly? And the successful person would say the buying the education way too late costs you money because of all the missed opportunity that you had. So if you're getting into a business, do not go in and go, well, I'm going to get in, do what I can do, build as much as I can do. And then once I'm stuck, then I'll finally ask for help. It's like, no, bulletproof it invest in that education framework systems, the right edu like the right people that have actually done what you're trying to do and start off that way, knowing that it's going to be much more costly to do that later than to do it right off the bat. Like, and if you're not willing to do that, then don't do it. Go partner with someone else's business, be a number two through 25 and be bring a valuable skill set to the table, but don't take the inherent risk of running the business. And obviously don't get all the upside either, but there's, plenty of great positions. Like there's even a guy that worked at a church elevation and he'd left and people hired him as a, con a consultant to come in, which is kind of like a contractor, not really running it because he had been a part of a big organization. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. Like I just had a 1.8 GPA, no skills, had to figure it out. Probably should have worked with someone else's company, but I didn't really know. So I interned for a different person's company for free. Wow. Like just to wow. see their frameworks. And then I built an entire list for them. My wife and I did. And we gave them the entire list to leave and go do our own thing. So that's what I would do. So, so impressive. I love it. I love everything you said there. And, um, you know, I think the biggest challenge for a lot of people in the beginning is they look at cost versus investment. They confuse the two. Um, it's unfortunate. I know I did. I did for many years, uh, getting out of the Marine Corps. That's how I looked at everything. It was a cost for it. And I didn't know I was my greatest investment. And now it's like when we make my wife and I, when we make decisions on large things that we're going to invest in mainly ourselves or our business, I, I think of the saying successful people make decisions, not on their current circumstances, but based on where they're going. Right now, I like to say within boundaries, right, you, you want to have some boundaries on how you're looking at that. Um, it can't be in something you have no idea in, but um, that's for another conversation. So, um, all right, last question for you, you and your wife, your family, you guys are doing what you're doing now. What is your vision moving forward? What's your 10 year vision or your ultimate vision uh, for your family, your company as you guys move forward? Yeah. So what we're doing right now is we're redefining what it means to be a businessman, changing the dictionary definition where you can't be a businessman without prospering in faith, health, relationships, and inside of the business. And our goal is that through the influence of the men, so through the guys that we work with, their influence growing where it's becoming noticeable, that people start picking up on this concept of the four-dimensional businessman that opens our doors where we're going to consult every major world leader on how they should run their country based on how our men run their households. So a biblical influence into countries based on the success of the men in our community. So that's mm -hmm. our like, we're already seeing it happen. We had a guy just the other day pray over the president of Panama. So it's not just me, but like, you know, we're just seeing that movement. So we'll, we're going to consult every major world leader on how they should run their country. Um, and at some point during that, we'll 
do a consult for over two hundred and fifty million dollars to do that, um, which is one of the one of the goals. But but with the men, individuals, because again, if you could do it with enough individuals, you have a big enough sample size that like, hey, this works. Now yeah. let's go take this out of clinical trial or whatever and like bring it into the masses. Hey, here's how we this is how we run life. This is how we do things. Here's our framework. That's awesome. Now that's a vision. That's what I'm talking about. I love that. That stuff gets me fired up. Well, I'm excited for your vision, what you guys are doing, how you're making an impact, uh, one person, one business at a time, but what's going right. to lead to a massive shift around the world. So I honor you for that and everything you went through because it's not always easy. A lot of times people see the fruit, but they don't see, you know, when you had to dig the hole and you had to plant and you had to water and give it sunlight, like they don't see the struggles. And I love your answer. Like, don't start business. Well, if business isn't always like this, right? We have our ups and downs and there's challenges. So do you yeah. have the mental fortitude to be able to persevere through that and lean on God in those moments, right? Trust that right. his wisdom is better than our own. So Nicholas, thank you for jumping on. Thank you for your time and sharing your message and your journey. If people want to get a hold of you or your mastermind, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, I talked about the apply page, which is fine. But also I talked about giving my book, Modern Day Businessman. I'm happy to pay for everything. Literally, I just need a place to send it. Best is Instagram.com slash Nicholas Barely. So just follow me on Instagram and connect there. And that's the best place. And I could point them in any direction, but if they want that book, then I'm happy to send it. Cool. We will definitely have that up for all of you that are interested in getting a hold of him, getting a copy of that book, and then checking out his mastermind and testimonials. So once again, thank you for uh, being a guest on the show today. We really Thanks, appreciate man. you. Uh, for everyone it. else, thank you for tuning into the Millionaire Series here at Master Life by Design. Make sure that you give it a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Click that notification button. And also comment below. What was your biggest takeaway? I'd love to hear what your biggest nugget was because you may have taken away something that someone else didn't even think of or even hear uh, because they were probably so busy writing notes. So with that, thank you guys for tuning in till our next show. Please make sure that you guys have a great blessed day and we will see you on the next episode of the Millionaire Series. Thanks, guys.